Uh, so uh, Martin and Brett here again from the RPS conference. Hello. And, yeah, uh, sorry, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, an old friend of mine is here, uh, Annette Jeans, who used to work at UCL in London, now works independently. I had the great pleasure of working with her at the London Nightingale Hospital. But here she's got an abstract about infection prevention in the film industry because she worked on films and I can't tell you the name of the film but I saw her name in the credits of one I went to see and I also had the pleasure of a day on it but it was just such an interesting experience I thought we'd talk to you about it so thanks very much for agreeing to have a chat well thanks for inviting me how did you end up working in the film industry well, having spent months with you, Martin, at the... Excel, Anything would be better. That's <laughs> exactly I, what I, I was looking. I was looking forward to a really nice holiday doing nothing, and I just happened to be um, answering the phone when someone said, would you like to work on a film? And I thought, actually, I'm quite bored sitting here doing nothing. Why not? And they said, it's only for a few weeks. And you don't have to do very much and I thought that sounds like my kind of job so, <laughs> <laughs> so yes and it ended up being about 10 months doing all sorts of weird things that I'd never imagined I would ever do but um, it was it was an experience yeah, yeah. well Brett was going to ask you a name drop which I mean, now know you can't do yeah. so yeah, yeah. For, for, for see it's a good thing I asked normally on this podcast we don't Screen and let the well, we actually whim it so we don't you know what we're going to ask no, at the time true. anyway. We but we, but right we, yeah. I did drop the you know, I might ask you a name, but but we can't. Yeah. But but um, still, I guess you you mentioned then you, you've seen some fascinating things or did the things you never thought you would think you would do. What were some of those things that you were involved with that you know you thought, wow? I mean, the day to day job. What was that? But then, yeah. what, what are the extra things? The, well, the day-to-day job on a film, from my perspective, was that we had to be there from the very beginning of the day to the very end of the day. So that would start at about half past six, seven o'clock in the morning. Actors are up there early, aren't they? Yeah, has to be up early. And because people, there is, there are, in the film you only see a few actors and you don't probably notice what's going on around. So they're building the sets, they're getting the set ready, they're setting up the cameras, the sound and various other things. And it's about making sure all of those people are safe within yeah. a COVID pandemic. So you had to be there to make sure that they understood what the risks were and to reassure them. Because a lot of the job was about reassuring them that this is a fragile virus, it's easy to clean away, you've got to be close to people, all, the, all sorts of things. So it was about being there in case they were nervous or frightened, and at the very beginning they were very nervous and frightened. And then at the end, so you were there while they were filming, and so you had to be, often you would be on the set itself, just on the edge, and you saw me I with did. my little, with my little watch timer, saying, yes. right, that you've had 10 minutes more soft, so off you go for a you know, air the place out, etc. And then at the end of the day, to make sure that the people who were clearing everything away and cleaning it, so in this particular film there were lots of bits of scenery which were hand painted, and so you couldn't just clean them, we were using a certain number of wipes. Am I allowed to say your wipes? No. And, um, and you couldn't use that, so you had to, we had to think of something else. So we would use hydrogen peroxide vaporisation overnight to clean various very dark really? areas in this wow. film. which. Okay. Um, so and so initially, it's a, a unit with the infection control. I think it's with everything. You put a lot of energy into the education, the reassurance, and the enabling. And in the end, they're telling you what to do. So it's um, so in the end, it got much easier because they knew what to do and they could anticipate things. But at the beginning, it was you were there for a very very long day. Some days I'd be there half six and I'd leave at ten o'clock at night. Yeah. Some days you worked all the way through the night, as you as you saw. Yeah. And you were in locations. Some days, well, I, did, I never saw the script and I never knew where I was going to be. So some days you would find yourself halfway up the country. At one point we were in Liverpool. Um, next, next we'd be down in an aerodrome somewhere. So it was, it was more interesting than sitting in an office in New Zealand. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> I mean, actually, it sounds like you did manage to achieve behaviour change because people were doing what they should be doing by the, by the end of it. And that's something possibly... I never achieved in the hospital, <laughs> and you managed it in ten weeks. But you know, so it's interesting that why do you think they actually did change their behaviours? Because they felt this is what's keeping us safe and employed, so therefore there's a what's in it for me. 
There is there is that element of it, but I think my approach was different because I'm so old and decrepit now. I, you can change because you've learned so much. And one of the things I realised, I knew nothing about this industry. I didn't know how they worked. I had to be there with them and ask them what they were doing and what they needed from me. So it started the other way around, rather than me going in the same, these are the rules, this is what you've got to do. It was about walking into, for example, the plaster workshop. There is plaster everywhere. And the rule was that everybody had to wear an FFP2 mask. And they've never worn a mask in the whole of their plastering career. So I went into this very dusty plaster workshop to explain, I'm sorry, but you've got to stand six feet apart, which often they needed three people together to do the job. Yeah. Um, and so it made no sense to them. And it was about listening from their perspective, how we could adapt and what we could do. So it was... It was very different to the way I had worked before. I know, and, I and think, actually, this yeah. is the right way, isn't it? Though, because yeah. I'm think I'm here thinking I haven't worked in critical care. Yeah, I'm not a dialysis nurse. Yeah, yeah, I'll go in and say this is what you need to do. Mm. Whereas, in fact, what you did was right. You go in and say I don't know anything about this. Show me what you do, and then we'll work our way around it. And that's a much mm. better way to go about things, isn't it? And would probably work much better in a hospital as well. Well, the, the, one of the things I realised, because in the, you probably saw when you came that day, they, would, they trusted me. So, and the, if there were things I didn't understand, I would ask them. So I would say, this doesn't make any sense to me. Explain why you are doing this. Mm. Not that you're wrong. It's just I don't understand and how we can fit the system to protect you. And so they trusted me. And sometimes there were things, so for example, wearing a mask when you're 20 feet up a ladder somewhere and you're leaning down to somebody and they're saying, it's dripping off my nose and, and it's dripping out of the ma mask and I'm hitting the person below me who's steadying the ladder when I'm there with them, saying, yeah, that really is interesting. And then you go back and think, you know, COVID transmission, is it likely to be a problem here? And looking at, the, you know, at that time, we didn't know what the transmissibility was going to be. And so you would, you would go through it with them and explain the rationale which normally I wouldn't have done that too much. You know, this is the answer. That's what the papers say. There weren't any papers written on. No. You. So no. We, it was no, you could write one now, of course. But. Yeah, and um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in seeing what people will do, not just in hospitals but outside health, acute healthcare, because it was clear because there were many facets to this job. So you had to do with transport, it had to do with construction, you had to do with all sorts of areas where the risks to some of those people were quite considerable, not necessarily COVID risks, but the, and there were, there's a lot that infection control could do without labeling it as something which is authoritarian or didactic. It was about actually understanding what the real risks were. With And I, I felt quite honoured because really COVID in terms of cleaning is relatively straightforward. It was the confusion was about the PPE and, and what you did about that. And that was, many of us didn't really understand what we should be doing anyway. So some of us were as confused as the people who were trying to do it. So, um, so yeah. What, so what, was, what was the time? So just refresh me. I know you two worked together in uh, Nightingale. So when did you start? What, what, so I'm just trying to picture, where is this in the pandemic? Oh, is this 2020? 2020, yes. 2020. So, so we oh, just had so a not unstaffable 4,000 yeah. bed a night a year in London. And, yeah. uh, yeah, and okay. it was, as soon as that ended, you were, you were actually back to working yeah. again. So yeah. it was pretty early on, no vaccine. Yeah, no, so, so, really. no, so early on. And, and um, how long yeah, yeah. did you do this for? Did Ten months. Mean? Ten months. Okay. Mm. And, and do, you, do you think that some of the things that you're involved with now would hold true in the sense that um, those some of those practices might still be there. I know, we, you know, not just for COVID, but for other things we might be concerned about. Do you think that there's been a bit of sustainability in what you've put in, or is that difficult because you're literally going in and just helping a particular group of people on a movie or set at a particular time? My understanding is that it has had the work that was done. I was not the only infection mm -hmm. control expert. Uh, there were lots of other people because um, each production had their, their own people. My understanding it has had an effect. So if I can give you an example of ventilation. In ventilation, I would go in and they would have this very tight set with all sorts of 
um, items around which are totally uncleanable because they've just made them by hand and you know painted them with watercolors etc and there would be you know in, in some scenes there were rats in cages there were also it was mm. it was very interesting but um but actually it's an infection control nightmare when you walk in <laughs> yeah. and then and then you realize that what can happen is they have the facility to lift a side of the room away take the mm. ceiling off the room turn the ventilation on and off um, in a way that you wouldn't be able to do in a healthcare facility yeah. so that they can increase the ventilation enormously just by designing the set so that they can take it to pieces mm, and that's yeah. that's so we in what they said was yes we can in the future we will do that we will although it'll be a tight set with very tight camera angles we can remove bits of it and pull it apart so it was so that's an example of how they as the film went on the way they constructed it was different and that continues today now was it nigel yesterday at ips was when he's talking about construction nigel Edwards, yeah. nigel Edwards is talking about construction of, of hospitals yeah and how and inflexible and how are. flexible they are yeah and then talked about the fact that maybe we think about where where does plumbing come in and out and whether the cabling come in and walls because we might need that ability to take a wall out or put a wall in um, to be able to change and adapt to whatever it is that we don't know we're going to deal with in five ten years to time so it's interesting that you know that that, that that's an example of something that in real life in another sector that you can do it yeah. yeah I mean it's a very temporary thing though filming isn't it and that's what I've got out of it it's all there and then 20 minutes later none of it is there you know and it's it's what you see on screen isn't quite it's all canvas and painted and so they, they are more able to do that but it's interesting the way they're now thinking I need to do this so therefore we'll just design that in from the beginning whereas we don't do that in healthcare. Yes but the the other thing is what they were because the their, our aim is associated with patients, patient safety, looking after the staff. Theirs is to produce a film and they have a finite budget often and making a film is very expensive so mm. they utilize their time really really well so mm. every day was tightly packed so in one studio we might be filming five different parts of you know we might doing a close-up of a hand we'd be doing something else in another corner so it's mm. about utilizing that space effectively but being yeah, safe at the yeah, same yeah. time yeah. so it was they this flexibility and this ability to turn over things quickly Required an enormous number of people to do that. Mm. So when you um, when you look at some of the riggers and some of the other people waiting at the side, they were waiting, ready to change all the lighting, and you, and you know, people re ready to change the scenery immediately. Yeah, that you don't have access to that in healthcare. No, I it's, mean the cost is people's time, and they recognise that. Yeah. So they factor it in. Whereas in healthcare, we don't factor in the cost of people's time. It's just that costs more money, even though actually it's going to take a lot more people. The, the, the you know the number of nurses aspect yeah, doesn't really come into it. It's, yeah. it's, it's the cost. But when we when we went, we went to Liverpool to do various scenes there, and they built sets in a day. They would put up hand wash stations and they would just say well, we need this 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 and this and we have the right people to do it and they would you know it would be you know i'd mm. say actually we need this and this and this or you need to change that around entirely it would just be done it yeah. was it was mm. a different sort of setup it mm. was it was and also if they were non-compliant and they were not absolutely essential for the film they would no longer be on the film 10 minutes later they would okay. be gone right so whereas in healthcare we have <laughs> certain rules well we wouldn't have many healthcare <laughs> workers left we'll be there to part of the problem. yeah so it's um, you know it's not it's non-compliance is not dealt with in that way so it was it was a different environment but then you still have to be kind to these people because these people are working in you know, it's quite stressful for them. They're quite frightened because we did have people acquiring COVID when they went home and various other places. So you've you've got to be this calming influence who appears to have everything under control. When you really <laughs> you've got you know, it's you know, it sounded yeah, well, like once you, once you can fake it, you've cracked it. Yeah, that's it. Martin's made a career of it. Yeah, I have so far, <laughs> yeah. I mean I mean the thing is that it's a completely different sphere as you said. You go in and you don't know anything, but you're gonna apply principles. So it's about looking actually a, recognizing the skills of a good IPC person isn't it and yeah. the negotiation and all the rest of it I mean you know if other people are thinking of oh, actually I might be able to do work in a completely different sphere but use my skills that you know 
could you just comment on the skills that we have that enable us to work across different things that we might have never even think we would work across? I, I don't know that I have a complete answer for you. I can only give it from my perspective, Martin, and that is that there's a willingness to listen and it's a willingness to recognise you don't know everything. I mean, my, my one of my habits when I was an ordinary standard fetch control nurse is as the telephone call comes in about some weird virus somewhere, I would say, could you just hold the call a minute? I've just got something coming in on the other line and I'd quickly look it up in a book. Yes. Um, but the... <laughs> It's, it's about recognising your limitations, but actually being ready to engage with people and understand their perspective. Because it may be, I mean, I had the same argument with them about, not argument, we had the same discussion about the vaccine, you know, should I be vaccinated? And it's, you can say, obviously, you know, there's lots of, you know, it's going to do this. The point is, they are asking you the question and they honestly want you to listen to why they are fearful, why they don't believe it. And that's, in, I found that quite interesting. So I think you have to be interested and willing to learn. You might not know all the answers, but there's usually somebody, you phone a friend or you, yeah. you, you figure it out because it is those basic principles principles of transmission and you know there's a lot of stuff about air and also, also you know I watch various things coming through and, and update people but it's I think you have to have a certain amount of humility so I think if you go in and you are um, you know absolutely sure of everything you're going to say and you're just bossing people about and do, making them do things which are not useful realistic or really associated with risk because that's the way people do things. So it's about <laughs> being willing to innovate. Um, and, and actually, maybe ask people what they, have you got a solution for this? You know, have mm. you got something that might work? It's, um, mm. Which I, I always find that they come up with much more interesting things than I have. Yeah, come well, they know, they, they know that what they need to do and they know their, their area, don't they? But I, I think you made a really good point about really listening. Yeah. And I'm not sure. I've always really listened. I might say, "What do you think?" And you know, and they would say, "Well, I can't do it because." And I've sort of almost switched off. Whereas, if you really do listen to them, then you can get some idea of their perspective, and then you might have a bit more chance of actually saying, "Okay, I really get your point of view now." So, therefore, this is what we may do. But I think you've made the point there. You see, it's it's that you you don't dismiss them. You don't dismiss their no. fears. You value their opinions. They may seem like very strange opinions, but within there is something that you can explore and something you can do something about. And it's that that takes a certain amount of expertise and finesse and willingness, maybe not to just barge in with the answer, because it's it's not going to help them. It might make you feel as if you've done the right thing, but sometimes there were enormous compromises, uh, which I had to, sometimes I had to judge, well, why have you said he can do this and he can't do that? And sometimes you you retrospectively make up a reason why uh, you know the rationale comes later because you you just know that you know listening to what they're saying this will work for them it will keep them safe how I justify it to everybody else is another story mm. and that's a tricky thing isn't it because you know people often want that this is the rule this is the black and white yeah. but actually sometimes you do have to flex things for one group yeah. whereas over here you can say that's what we're going to need to yeah. do and, yeah. and we did it in our clinical practice that obviously I won't. About. Yeah. yeah, but you know, being flexible does reap rewards because then people will recognise that you're being flexible, and therefore more likely to respond in a positive. You have to be flexible, but not totally inconsistent. No, not not, com yeah. not completely. Yeah. But it's, um, yeah, but it's um, some, and sometimes I had to write reports full of terminology and language um, which they didn't understand, which actually seemed to work quite well for some of the hierarchy, because the, the more uh, incomprehensible it was, the more impressive it was. Um, so you know, there were there were times where you had to change, so you're talking to a plumber one minute about, is this really important, we have the tap facing this way because you know, it makes a noise or something. And then you're talking to somebody else, a producer or somebody else who says, you know, you've got to tell me why this is happening. It's um, so you you that flexibility comes in there. Your the way you respond to people is different, but it's, it comes back to the basic practices of infection control, the principles of transmission and prevention. It's not anything. I always said as we used to say to them, it's not rocket science. And they said, well, why are we paying you so much then? <laughs> but um, but it was relatively simple when you when you drill down. Mm. Well, I think we've all written a report that's set on a. 
uh, desk or <laughs> got a bit dusty or never been yeah. right. Yeah. Um, but it was been fascinating talking to you. Uh, and listening to this and actually hearing both of you obviously sitting here listening, observing you two and, and watching how you interact we've clearly worked together beautifully we had a lot of discussions so, it was yeah. really good fun I have to so, say one of the best experiences I've had mm, mm. Well, we, we, we both enjoy what we do yeah. and we um, well, he used to say that he stole my jokes but I haven't heard any of his recently so I can't steal his at the moment he, he hasn't got any new ones no, no. <laughs> um, I'm heavily into recycling and sustainability now <laughs> On that bombshell. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much. Thank yeah, you. Thanks, thanks very much. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for listening. Hello, everybody. And uh, Brett Mischer at the IPS conference with Martin. And we've got, we've bumped into, or actually we've bumped into you a few times, for Jean-Yves Maliard. Uh, Jean-Yves, welcome. Thanks for coming. Well, thank you very much, Brett. Had to walk up the stairs to join us here yeah. at, the, at the conference. <laughs> <laughs> Look, um, you gave a fascinating talk this morning. Uh, as part of uh, the Tina Bradley lecture. And um, one of the things that you touched on were dry surface biofilms. Why do we need to be concerned about dry surface biofilms? Can I, can I just bob in? I, I actually don't think people believe it at the moment. Because I heard a very eminent microbiologist at the HIST meeting uh, a couple of weeks ago saying, do they really exist? I'm not sure I believe they do. So, Yeah, yeah I mean, we, uh, it, it's quite a... Uh, um, I guess a, a new science, and, and uh, I came interested uh, into that when I bumped into Karen Vickery, who's yeah. the first one who reported dry surface biofilms, and she, she, she reported them actually on on, uh, on breast implants, uh, and then looking oh, in okay, the yeah. uh, okay. and and, a, um, and then looking in the environment, also find those aggregates of microorganisms. Um, but what's so specific about them is they've got the characteristic of a biofilm. Um, because they're producing quite a lot of exopolysaccharide around them. Uh, and, and what's fascinating about that is, is um, they're there. They're a bit random, so it's a bit like a, a needle in a headstock when you when, when to, want to look at, at those on, on surfaces. They're a bit random, uh, but they're suddenly there, and they're, they're very complex. Uh, yeah. uh, they contain multi-species. Uh, and I, I, I understood some people said, oh, it's just dry microorganisms on surfaces are just posited on, on do nothing. Well, they're not such things, you know. Uh, yeah. They're actually, yes, probably embedded in fermates, but they are uh, they are there and, and they, they can grow. Uh, when you've got wet phase, dry phase, um, they, they will develop and, and stay there. And, um, and with our work, uh, we, we actually show that most of the su- uh, surfaces we sample in hospitals uh, we find those dry surface biofilms. So not only we find them, a uh, complex species, uh, but we uh, we also can see them uh, with electron microscopy. Mm. So we we know they're there. Um, Problem for the average hospital is we don't have an electron microscope. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and <laughs> if you go sampling using conventional methods, you don't grow it either, do you? And and so that's that's the problem. So how you know? So therefore, people only believe what they can see. Yes, that's absolutely right. Well, that's most bugs on surfaces, you know. Yeah. We had that argument before about the role of surfaces in transmitting microorganisms. Yeah. People didn't believe that for mm. a long time. So, yeah, yeah, surface infections or cleaning, well, it doesn't matter. So I think it's the same with the dry surface biofilms. You, you will not see them. And when they're really dry on surfaces, uh, wet swabbing doesn't work. You can't pick them up. Um, and we've seen that many times. We've tried that with contact plate as well. It doesn't work. Mm-hmm. But when they're being disturbed, so after a, a cleaning or even immediately after disinfection, when you disturb them, then you're starting to transfer them. They are trans- transferable, and, and we've done that with direct contact uh, or via the gloves, uh, different type of gloves. That's right, Greg Whiteley's work mm. and yeah, yes. Karen Rickley's work showed that you, you actually pick things up on gloves and then move Absolutely. them around. Absolutely, we've, we've done exactly the same, uh, and we show that it's actually highly trans- uh, transferable, but when they are being disturbed. Okay. Uh, and so the, the questions we have at the moment is the cleaning and, and disinfection on the surface is a problem then. Mm-hmm. Uh, because again, well, if you disturb those dry surface biofilms, are you going to, to make the matter worse? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's why I was taking, uh, saying today that, well, not necessarily, but you need to, to be aware of that and to have a product that works. And so far, all the product we tested, you need to have a, um, uh, a, a mechanical physical removal as well as a, an antimicrobial activity and that's worked the best so mm. uh, uh, I mean some slide I show some, some quack based product we're working mm. pretty well mm. uh, 
again, Drosophis bias, endorphin, as well as peristic acid. But also what I say, uh, it's all the debate again about what is a, a safe surface. You know? uh, nobody can answer that. Mm. But I, uh, for me, I mean, what we're looking at it is not only reducing microorganisms on surfaces, and I know all the guidelines say to a safe level, but I'd, I go further than that because it's reducing the number of microorganisms on surface, but then you cannot transfer microorganisms from that surface to other surfaces after cleaning all this infection, and that's a safe product for me. Mm -hmm. So yeah, your okay. surface now is, might still have microorganisms, but they're not transferable. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, or the number is so low, they're not transferable. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's a safe surface. So if you wanted to try and find dry surface biofilms, you mentioned just after cleaning, good time to do it. So if you're going to go... It depends on the agent you clean with, though. Yeah, it? yeah, yeah. I, I certainly would like to do that because... If your um, goal was to find them, right? So if, you, yeah. if it wasn't part of, I want to test it after you've cleaned with an appropriate product. But if you just wanted to go and find to see if you've got these... On your on your de nursing station desk, uh, what would be the best way to do it? Well, I think immediately after cleaning on on, on, the, on these infections, uh, on the Sunday, we certainly would like to try that in the UK. So you follow mm. the cleaning team at six o'clock in the morning or whatever, mm. five or six mm. o'clock in the morning, immediately when the surface is still disturbed and wet, to swab mm. that surface mm. uh, and, and see what we find. On, on I guess uh, we will find. Uh, Does it have to have a disinfectant? In terms of in terms of like trying to find the biofilm, no, does it help to try and disrupt it to I, find I, it? I think it, it's uh, it will work better with the detergent. No? Yeah, okay. On the mixed detergent disinfectant because of surfactant, so you will mm. disturb the, the surface, but the, the physical mechanical. Mm. So if you only brush the surface very lightly with no mm. force whatsoever, mm. you won't see probably anything. Yeah. Okay. But if you're doing the apply the normal techniques for mm. surface disinfection, then you should be able to start seeing mm. something. I mean, you made a good point as well about friction being needed to physically remove things as part of the cleaning and decontamination, and that's why possibly using hydrogen peroxide vapour isn't, if you don't clean well to start with, isn't going to be effective because it may not penetrate the glycolex, but possibly UV does, is that, is that your feeling? Cause yeah, I mean, uh, but my feeling with, with UV is it, it, might, it will reduce the number of, of uh, viable bacteria and dry surface biofilms, but not all of them. Mm. Uh, we haven't tried UV. Uh, that's mm. something that's only mm. we want to do. A number of companies want to try the UV on the dry surface biofilm. Fantastic! So we'll have some data on that. Mm. Um, but uh, again, we, you know, it, it's always fascinating uh, understanding or discovering new things about bacteria. We, th we thought they could not survive high level disinfection, very aggressive oxidizing agent. They can. Yeah. Um, so with UV, you're thinking, well, do they have any damage repair? Possibility uh, against UV radiations and, and so on. I mean, those those dry surface biofilm they're desiccated, desiccated microorganisms, so they are they will have a lower water content. So I'm thinking, is the UV is going to work as well? I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And we're only starting to find with some microorganisms where they've got also repair mechanisms uh, to palliate some damage caused to uh, um, that, uh, to, to the DNA as well, uh -huh. like Enterobacter. Uh, okay. is one of them. Um, uh, to some extent they can, so uh, we're just mm -hmm. exploring it. So as I said, it's quite a new field of research um, and there's still so many things to do and to understand, mm -hmm. and especially in, on, on, on terms of, of bioinformation, you know, how do they get on the surface? Mm -hmm. I mean, certainly they're deposited through formites, uh, hands and so on, and then they're able to grow on, on yeah. the stem. It could be really fascinating, like, what are the factors that uh, influence that growth? You know, it, does it, does it is it a combination of X, Y, and Z? Do they have to be in a certain way, or is it, is it going to be more humidity or less humidity? Is, you know, I might be fascinating to know what is the cause, initial cause of them. But my feeling is, is you have to have humidity. Uh, mm. You have to have some, some water at some stage on the surface. So imagine mm. that you're, you're cleaning the surface, and you're at one point they're going to well, get wet, or you put some liquid on the surface, like your cup of tea or whatever. Mm. So you're going to wet the surface at one point. And I think for the, the bacteria to thrive and to grow, then they, they, they will need some humidity at some stage, definitely. Mm. Mm. But again, the hospital we're sampling, the old hospital, you know, they've been there for a very long time. Yeah. And they've got quite, even if the surface look absolutely clean, mm. uh, there's a lot of grime on it. Mm. <laughs> Is there any potential for coming up with a system that would enable somebody working in the average hospital to visualise a biofilm? Because I have this thing about, if you go to the dentist and they say your kids aren't cleaning your teeth very well, yeah. use a disclosing tablet and it shows up all the biofilm. Mm. I know that's gr like huge yeah. amounts. Mm. But is there a, any potential for something like that? Oh, uh, absolutely. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think that that's the way forward, especially for training and so on. The problem mm -hmm. we have is with some, some 
die we could use is the permanent die, so you would stay on the surface okay. forever. <laughs> uh, okay. So it's trying to find the a solution. The hospital might be blue. Yeah. 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 So it's trying, you're trying okay. to find a solution that yeah. actually um, that, that is not permanent, so you're, okay. yeah. you, you can remove it. I mean, otherwise it's like physical. I mean, we're working yeah. with uh, Roman spectroscopy for the moment, and on, on good, good promising mm. uh, as well. So you've got a little gun, you put that on. I tell you, it's not only what you, if you've got dry surface biofilm, but what species you've got as well. Wow. Mm. Okay. So they should be able to do that as well. But it's, it's quite early days, but but hopefully, okay. the next, next couple of years, we'll have a bit more solutions to offer about purely training. Now, I know we like to keep these things short, but there, are, there is have we got time for one more question. Yeah, because we have. Go on. Um, now, when you talked today, someone asked a question about... Actually, no, it wasn't ask a question. You, you raised a really interesting point, which is close to my heart, too, about claims about residual effect. Um, what was you... Because we could talk about this, perhaps, as a separate podcast, but is there is there... What would you like to see, if someone's going to make a claim about residual effect, what would you like to see if you were evaluating that, you know, if you're in someone in the hospital going, I'm going to think about this as a residual claim, what should they be looking for to go, is this legitimate, is this, what are they considered in that, what, you know? Yeah, I mean, well, there is yeah. a pre-standard at the moment uh, in, in Europe that uh, to investigate residual activity, they're looking at the long-term efficacy of that product on surfaces following different abrasions, wet and dry abrasions. Uh, so that's a starting point. Mm. Uh, it is a bit of a, of a tough test, but it's a bit like a capacity test where uh, every so often you add more bugs on the surface. I was going to say, how does it affect real life? Because you know, in real life, you're going to exactly. clean it, then you're going to have people doing stuff, yeah, which is just going to contaminate it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that yeah. test is, 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 yeah. uh, is reproducing that. But right. um, uh, it, it is okay. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm sure it can be improved like any, yeah. any test. Yeah. Uh, the last challenge is quite a large, large number of microorganisms mm. after 24 hours. And then it shows that the surface is working still active or, or not. Mm -hmm. uh, but however, my, 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 uh, my, my issue is with that is not necessarily the, the long-term e efficacy or the result claim is you've got my, uh, antimicrobial on surfaces. Uh, you've got loads of different microorganisms potentially on the surfaces. Is what the impact of that in selecting for microorganisms that are less susceptible to that active on the surface? Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think all those residual activity is standard on claim. I'm, I'm not against it, but mm -hmm. it's only part of the test that needs to be done. I think company should really also look at the impact of having such a low concentration of surfaces on selection for mm -hmm. AMR. Mm -hmm. okay. That's really important in, in, in now day, mm -hmm. isn't it? It's, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd like to come back to this topic actually one day because I yeah. think we need to explore this a bit more. Yeah. I've, and I've seen companies make some extraordinary claims about weeks of, oh, yeah. of activity. So, and, um, and yeah. I mean, there's another thing as well. I mean, at the moment, there's lots of work, at least in Europe, on antimicrobial surfaces, which is mm. a completely different topic. But I, it, there's going to be a very fine line between residual activity for a period of time and then mm. what's claimed as antimicrobial surfaces. Mm. Uh, at the moment, there's no much definition between the two, but if yeah. you residual activity is more than 24 hours, is that an antimicrobial surface at the end of the day? So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. so there is there is uh, some debate at the moment, and, and I think yeah. uh, we'll, we'll see some movement in the next year uh, as to yeah. some definition as to what is what. Right, well, thank you very much, Johnny, yeah. and uh, thank you very much for doing it in a French accent. Like <laughs> this morning. I know it was a struggle for My you. My pleasure, but, uh, yes, yes, <laughs> I still remember that talk. Yes. Yeah, next, next time you can yeah. do it in Australia. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks very much for joining us, I really appreciate it. Really thank you. Thank you.